Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Uh, Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So I literally just uh, ran into my, my house um, and I'm just catching my breath after, after coming from the airport. SubhanAllah, very emotional um, day and, and you know, uh, going, coming from the janazah of Muhammad Ali, rahmatullah alayhi. And um, obviously I'm going to summarize the juz, but I just want everyone to remember him and his family in your du'as. And subhanAllah, if you read the post that I wrote, you know, I, I literally wrote that on the way home. And one of the things that I really want to emphasize to people is that, you know, without without being too, well, actually, I'm going to be very explicit that people are so focused on the selfies and getting selfies with the casket and, and just, and, and you know, proving to the world that they were there. <clears throat> but sadly, there wasn't much time for reflection. It didn't feel like a janazah in many ways. And, um, you know, I, it's important for us to remember uh, the place that this man has in our ummah, the things that he's done for us. And obviously, um, the fact that we have to be very, 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 you know, conscious about where we are, who we are, uh, you know, and, and what the occasion is. But I don't want to rant too much about that at all. I just want everyone to make dua for him, inshallah. Make dua for him, make dua for his family. Uh, may Allah have mercy on him and accept all the good that he did for this ummah. Um, and did for humanity, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for his uh, for his family. Allahumma ameen. <clears throat> so anyway, we move on now to Juz 5, inshallah ta'ala. So this Juz is actually going to be entirely in Surah Tanisa, entirely in the fourth Surah, which is the Surah of the Women. Uh, it's from verse 24 to 147 of Surah Tanisa now. And Surah Tanisa is very interesting. The Prophet sallam used to read this uh, Surah uh, after Surah Al-Baqarah, and his Qiyam, actually, he read uh, Al-Baqarah, and Nisa, and then Ali Imran. So uh, it's 177 verses. It's actually the longest surah of the Quran in regards to the number of words uh, that it has after Surah Al-Baqarah. So it's the second longest surah in the Quran. It's the most difficult to memorize. I think if you ask any of the Hufad, uh, you know, we all struggled with Surah Nisa. Everyone struggles with Surah Nisa. It's a very tough surah to memorize because it obviously has a lot of law and it moves from the uh, the, the spiritual to the to the legal. So, you know, you, you have the spiritual admonitions that come in Surah Al-Baqarah and Ali Imran, and now you have the legal rulings that come in Surah Nisa. So as we said, it's a continuation of the end of Surah Ali Imran, which is talking about the end of the Battle of Uhud. So it, it comes in the context of revelation immediately um, after the Battle of Uhud. Uh, and so it starts off verse 24. And subhanAllah, it's very beautiful that Allah in this in this surah, which contains so much law and so much legislation, actually gives us the purpose of the legislation. From verse 26 to verse 28. In 26, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَكُمْ وَيَهْدِيَكُمْ سُنَنَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَيَتُوبَ عَلَيْكُمْ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ That Allah wants to make clear for you the lawful from the unlawful and guide you to the good practices of those that came before and to accept your repentance. And Allah is all knowing and all wise. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He wants to make things clear for us. He wants to, to He wants the path not to be ambiguous. He wants it to be clear. And just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admonishes us from uh you know from, from overindulging in uh or, or, or he admonishes Ahlul Kitab, I'm sorry, he admonishes the people of the book for their faults, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he wants to guide you to the good things that they did, so that you can understand the good sunan that they left behind as well, so that you focus on not just the bad of the previous nations, but you focus on the good as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to uh, accept your repentance, and Allah is all-knowing and all-wise. Then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <clears throat> Wallahu yuridu an yatuba alaykum. So, and Allah wants to accept your repentance. It's very beautiful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reiterates this twice within two ayat. Allah wants to accept your repentance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to forgive you. So Allah wants to make things clear for you. He's making the path clear for you. And the goal of making that path clear for you is not that you stumble. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to make it past it. He wants you to, to walk that path in the right way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see you succeed. You have a Lord that is merciful whose mercy has preceded his anger by his own prescription, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah has guided you to the path, he's shown you the path, and Allah wants you to succeed and cross the path successfully. 
And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا And Allah wants to lighten your difficulties because Allah knows that man was created weak. So if you take these three ayat together where Allah really gives us the purpose of law, it's quite beautiful. The first one, Allah wants to make it clear for you. There is no ambiguity. The second thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to succeed. He wants to forgive you. The third thing, on the way to attaining that salvation and that forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah wants to make things easy for you on the way. So He doesn't just want you to be forgiven in the hereafter and to attain salvation in the hereafter. Allah wants to forgive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to lighten your burden on the way. So Allah has legislated something that's e easy. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. He doesn't burden you beyond your scope. المشقة تجلب التيسير. This is a principle in our in, in our uh, in our in our fiqh in our jurisprudence that hardship always gives way to ease. Okay, الضرورات تبيح المحظورات. You know, uh, necessity makes things that are ordinarily prohibited temporarily permitted. So Allah subhanahu wa taala wants to make things easy for you. The law does not make things difficult on you. The law actually makes this life easier for you as well. What that means is, what we'll find is that everything that Allah has legislated for us in this world, though the ultimate goal of the law is to attain Allah's pleasure and success in the hereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it for our own good in this world as well. Right? So Allah restricting us from alcohol, for example. Yes, it's to attain His pleasure and to attain His success, but we can see the harmful effects of alcohol in our society. So Allah only restricts us from things that are good for us and He lightens the burden from us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want us to feel a sense of mashaqqa, to feel a sense of burden and hardship with the law. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summarizes in the surah of law what the purpose of the law is, and that's verses 26 uh, to 28. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I just want to go, go through some of these verses. Verse 34, which is the abused verse in the Quran. You know, some people call it the verse of abuse. It is truly the abused verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the procedure. If a person, um, you know, has conflict with his spouse, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that first you, you admonish, then you refuse to share a bed. And then you, 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 you know, the translation is you strike them lightly or you beat them lightly or so on and so forth. And this is truly an abused verse. Why? Because the Prophet wasallam. this is a very short answer, by the way, but this is the, the, the most precise answer. The Prophet wasallam is the manifestation of the Quran. And the Prophet wasallam reached divorce with his wife Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha. And the Prophet ﷺ never struck any one of his wives. So wife beating is not something that's found in the Qur'an. If you want to understand the Qur'an, you look at the Prophet ﷺ. You do that throughout the Qur'an. So وَضْرِبُوهُنْ would not mean to beat lightly or to strike. Rather, you know, it seems, and Allah knows best, uh, that it's to strike an example. And this was what Imam al-Awza'i rahimahullah ta'ala said. Or if not, then obviously, you know, a, a strike that's symbolic or whatever it may be, there was never a concept of domestic abuse or violence that is to be legislated in the Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ prohibited it. And the Prophet ﷺ himself never did it, though he reached the stage of divorce, of almost separating from his wife Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha. So therefore, this verse is truly the abused verse. Okay, it truly is the abused verse. Um, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, uh, to, to give us true understanding of the Qur'an and to allow us to manifest it in our own lives. Allahumma ameen. Then in verse 36, there's a term. So, so the first 35 verses of Surah An-Nisa relate to An-Nisa, relate to women, which is why the chapter is named Surah An-Nisa. Uh, verse 36 onwards for the rest of Surah An-Nisa actually doesn't focus on women's laws at all. Uh, but rather, it, it goes into many different things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ihsana, wa I'm sorry, I'm blanking out. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and worship Allah and do not associate anything with Him. <clears throat> and to your parents do good, and to your relatives, and to your orphans, and to the needy, and to the near neighbor, 
uh, and to the neighbor that's far away. So to the neighbor that's close to you and to the neighbor that's far away, the companion that's at your side, the traveler, those whom your right hands possess. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like those who are self-deluding and boastful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns to a general rule of ihsan across the board that you show excellence to everyone, starting with your parents, ending with a stranger or a wayfarer that you've never met before. Now, just to, to connect this to, this to the ayat that came before, if the sunnah teaches us بالمعروف, those who are closest to you are most deserving of your good character and good behavior, then how can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same breath be saying to abuse women, but then be good to the stranger and be good to the neighbor that lives far away from you? It doesn't make sense, right? So this is a surah that is teaching ihsan, that's teaching a person to show excellence to the people um, around them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 41, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا How will it be, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when we bring upon every ummah, when we bring upon every nation a shaheed, a witness, وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا And we bring you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a witness upon all of them. So this idea here, um, this idea here is that the Prophet وسلم, is a witness upon all of mankind. Why is this so important and why is this so crucial for us to understand? The Prophet وسلم, was once sitting with Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and he said to Ibn Mas'ud, read the Quran to me. And ibn Mas'ud said, Ya Rasulullah, aqra'u alayk wa alayka unzid, you want me to read to you and it was revealed to you. The Prophet وسلم, he said, I love to hear the Qur'an being recited by other than me. He loves to hear it from his companions, particularly Ibn Mas'ud, who the Prophet وسلم, said, whoever wants to hear the Qur'an recited fresh as the day that it was revealed, let him listen to the recitation of Abdullah bin Mas'ud anhu. So Ibn Mas'ud anhu said that I started to recite to him Surah Nisa. He said, until I reached this verse, verse 41, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا How will it be, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you know, when we bring upon every nation a witness and we bring you as a witness upon all of these different nations. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam put his hands on my knee and he said, حَسْبُكْ Stop. So I looked up. And I saw that his eyes, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, were flooded with tears. The tears were just running down. They were like faucets, subhanallah. Literally, the tears coming down and wetting his beard. Why? Because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam understood the amana, the trust that's been given to him, and that he will one day have to bear witness upon all these nations that we're hearing about of Bani Israel in Surah Al-Baqarah. And of course, this nation of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we ask Allah that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is an intercessor for us on the day of judgment, rather than a uh, a witness against us. And the beauty of this is that if you connect this to the previous juz, where Allah subhanahu wa taala says uh, uh, that from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa taala, lin talahum, you have a natural leniency towards the believers. Walau kunta fadlan ghalid al qalbi lan fadlu min hawlik. And had you been rude and harsh hearted. They would have left you. So Allah already testified to the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ, the love that he has for this ummah in the previous juz. And in this juz, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the Prophet ﷺ being brought as a witness upon us. Then if you fast forward to verse 43, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the believers not to approach the prayer while they are drunk. And here you also have the ruling of tayammum, the legislation of tayammum. Tayabum is when you don't have water, then you simply strike the surface, you strike the dust with your hands, and you wipe your, you know, you, you wipe upon uh, your face. Basically, this, you know, you can actually look it up. Subhanallah, I, I did a, a, a video on Quran Weekly a long time ago called Aisha's Necklace. It's a beautiful, beautiful story with many lessons. The short version of it, the Sahaba were on a journey, or they were on an expedition. Aisha radiallahu anha lost her necklace. The Prophet ﷺ held up the entire caravan. They looked everywhere for that necklace. Because of the delay, they ran out of water. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated the uh, tayammum, which is if you don't have water, you can still make wudu. You can save the, the little water that you had for drinking, and you can still make uh, wudu. So 
the you know or you can still do tayammum in the place of wudu and this connects to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says 20 ayat earlier yuridullahu liyukhaffifa ankum Allah wants to make things easy upon you Allah is not interested in making things difficult upon you Allah wants to make things easy for you so subhanallah just 20 ayat after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying he wants to make things easy for you Allah legislates for us the gift of tayammum that when we don't have water or when water would be damaging to us or we have wounds or whatever it may be then we can opt for tayammum instead if you move on to verse 48 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalika liman yasha وَمَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ افْتَرَى إِثْمًا عَظِيمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and indeed Allah does not forgive association with him, but he forgives everything else for whom he wills. So, وَاللَّهُ يُرِيدُ أَنْ يَتُوبَ عَلَيْكُمْ 20 ayat before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah wants to forgive you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Allah will forgive anything except for shirk, except for associating a partner with him. Why? Because at least you have to acknowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek his forgiveness. So shirk by, by necessity uh, or you know takes a person out of that acknowledgement. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he forgives everything else. He forgives everything else for whom he wills. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for all of our sins, the small, the large, uh, the public and the private ones. Allahumma ameen. Ten ayat later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَن تُؤَدُّ الْأَمَانَةِ لِأَهْلِهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands you to render trusts, to give back the trust to those uh, whom uh, they are due. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا حَكَمْتُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ أَن تَحْكُمُوا بِالْعَدْلِ Then if you judge between the people that you judge with justice, connect that to the previous juz in Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised some of Ahl al-Kitab some of the people of the book, مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ مَنْ إِنْ تَأْمَنْهُ بِقِنْطَارٍ يُؤَدِّهِ إِلَيْكَ That from the people of the book are those that if you trust with a huge amount of wealth, they will pay it back to you. And if you remember in the beginning of this juz, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the, you know, the importance of learning from سُنَنَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ The goodness of those who came before you as well. So here, in Allah Ya'murukum, Allah commands you, O Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to fulfill the trusts and to uh, to judge justly uh, between the people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Yuhaladina Aminu, Atiyu Allaha wa Atiyu Rasul wa Ulul Amri Minkum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and obey those who have been given authority. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرَدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you, uh, if you have any disagreement, this is justice if you're judging, وَإِذَا حَكَمْتُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ That you will put um, everything to the side to judge justly between the people. So when you judge between people, whether it's your family members or people that are closer to you or you have an interest or an agenda, whatever it may be, then you take things back to Allah, His Messenger, and to the authority. And when there is a dispute, you take it back to Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that is the basis of your judgment, meaning you are being a person of justice, despite circumstances that make it difficult for you uh, to be just. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala then says in verse 65, six ayat later. فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِيمَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتْ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, No by your Lord, they do not truly believe until they make you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the final judgment. They make you the judge concerning everything they dispute about. And they find within themselves no discomfort from what you have judged and they submit to that full, uh, you know, they submit to that sunnah completely. They submit to it with a full, willing submission. This is a continuation of Al-Baqarah and Ali Imran. In Al-Baqarah, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the people uh, harming their prophets. And Allah warns the believers from not harming their prophets the way that the previous ummah harmed their prophets. In Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يَحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمُ اللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ 
Say, if you truly love Allah, then follow me. Follow the Prophet wasallam, and Allah will love you back. And Allah is all forgiving and all merciful. Here Allah takes it to another step, another level. فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ They do not believe until they make the Prophet wasallam the source until that's where the disputes end. They, they agree upon the Prophet ﷺ being uh, in his example والسلام, and in his person, if you were alive at his time, they agree that his sunnah, his judgment is the way that all disputes are settled. Not only that, they don't feel any hardship inside of them or they don't feel any discomfort inside of them for what they have, uh, for what he has judged. وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا And they fully submit. Okay, so listen, this is the most important point of the entire lecture. Focus. First two juz, or the first few juz, sorry. Allah mentions people going astray for two reasons. What are those two reasons? Desires and pride. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us, they put aside their desires, yet for what? For what the Prophet ﷺ has judged, لا يجد في أنفسهم حرج مما قضيت. So they make their desires conform to what the Prophet ﷺ has judged. As for pride, يُسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا They fully submit themselves to the sunnah and the judgment of the Prophet ﷺ and they put their pride and they put their arrogance, um, you know, they put their arrogance down, their ego down um, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتْ وَيُسَلِّمُوا تَسْنِيمًا Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions uh, verse 75. Allah goes into the laws of fighting and battle as well in verse 75. وَمَا لَكُمْ لَا تُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْمُسْتَضْعَفِينَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَالنِّسَاءِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, why is it that you don't fight for the sake of God and for the, uh, and for the oppressed amongst men, women and children? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us the noble, the noble purpose of battle in the first place. That it was not to fight for the sake of persecution, not to oppress anyone, not to turn anyone away from their religion. Rather, the people fought for the sake of God, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and particularly to protect the oppressed, to protect the weak from the men, the women, the children, because that was the noble goal of that fighting in the first place. So this is after again, once again, the battle of Uhud. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the believers to remain firm um, in that regard. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to the believers uh, verse 79, because if you remember in, Surah, uh, in the battle of Uhud, uh, you know, there was defeat and there was this sense of taking responsibility uh, for your own shortcomings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that ma asaba ka min hasanatin famin Allahi that whatever has come to you of good, then it's from Allah. Wa ma asaba ka min sayyatin and if anything bad comes to you famin nafsika, then it is from yourself. So when good comes to you, attribute it to Allah. When bad comes to, to you, attribute it to your own doings. Now another connection to make. That's verse 79. That when good happens to you, thank Allah. When bad happens to you, you don't blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's because of what you yourself have earned. In verse 82, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Do they not... Uh, contemplate the Qur'an or do they have locks on their hearts? Do they not contemplate the Qur'an or do they have locks upon their hearts? And subhanAllah, do they not contemplate the Qur'an the way the Prophet ﷺ and Ibn Mas'ud did in, in, you know, uh, in the verse um, you know, uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Prophet ﷺ being brought as a witness upon people. So here, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do they not contemplate the Qur'an or do they have locks on their hearts? Those are the sins. If you connect verse 79, which is that if bad, if good comes to you, thank Allah. And if bad comes to you, then it's from yourself. And verse 82, which is that your failure to appreciate and understand the Qur'an is because of your own sins. Then basically both of these above concepts are that you take responsibility for both your spiritual shortcomings 
and your worldly favors. So again, both uh, your worldly failures, sorry. You take responsibility for both your spiritual shortcomings and your worldly uh, failures. And then verse 87 is the third consecutive, Allahu la ilaha illahu. Allahu la ilaha illahu. Okay? That Allah, there is no deity, no God except for Him. First you had Ayatul Kursi, Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum. Then you had the beginning of Surah Ali Imran, Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum, nazzal alayk al kitab. And here you have in this next juz again, Allahu la ilaha illahu. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning, لَيَجْمَعَنَّكُمْ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ وَمَنْ أَصْدَقُ مِنَ اللَّهِ حَدِيثًا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assemble you to be accounted for on the Day of Judgment, to be judged on the Day of Judgment, of which there is no doubt. So again, another, لَا رَيْبَ There is no doubt. And who is more truthful than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in statements? So the tone of Surah An-Nisa is warning, whereas the tone of uh, Ali Imran is invitation. So Surah An-Nisa is warning after the invitation um, has been given. The next section of Surah An-Nisa really goes into the laws of war, uh, talks about avoiding murdering innocent people, seeking not seeking safety with hypocrites and making alliances with the hypocrites and so on and so forth. Uh, verse 102 and is, is very beautiful because it's a long verse about Salat al-Khawf, about the, the prayer of fear. So it teaches people how to pray even in battle. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching the believers that even battle is not an excuse for you to miss your salah, to uphold your covenant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the next verse, فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمُ الصَّلَاةِ فَاذْكُرُ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِكُمْ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when you finish the prayer, Remember Allah standing, sitting, and as you lie on your sides. This is of course similar to the last 10 verses of Ali Imran. In fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa ikhtilaf al layli wal nahar la ayat li uli al albab alladhin yathkurun Allah qiyaman wa qu'udan wa ala junubihim. So those who remember Allah standing, sitting and upon their sides. So Allah says when you finish your prayer, remember Allah standing, sitting or lying on your sides. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَتْ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوتًا That verily, the prayer has been decreed upon the believers within its specified times. Within its decreed specified times. What does that mean? Okay, why is that so special here? Because Allah chose to mention to us this verse, that prayer has to be prayed on time in regards to battle, even battle. Even if there is a battle going on, it's not an excuse for you to miss your salah. You have to uphold your salah. So what then of the believers that don't have those situations like those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning? Um, in verse 116, Allah reiterates that Allah forgives everything except for associating a partner um, with Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then mentions to us, as He does in many parts of the Qur'an, in verse 120 of the shaitan coming to a person from all uh, directions and trying to lead him astray. Um, and he يَعِدُهُمْ وَيُمَنِّيهِمْ He promises you and, and he makes you have wishful thinking. But everything he promises you is pure deception, pure delusion. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in verse 123 that, uh, that a person, that Allah is just towards all. لَيْسَ بِأَمَانِيِّكُمْ That it is not by your wishes or amani أَهْلِ kitab, And it's not by the wishful thinking of أَهْلِ kitab, the people of the book, that you enter into Jannah. But instead, it's if you do a good deed, you will be rewarded for it. And if you do wrong, you will be punished for it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, just as He was just to the people of the book, He is just towards you as well. What's going to get you to Jannah is your effort to uphold that covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and calling upon Him for mercy uh, throughout the process. In verse 135, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kunu qawwa amina bil qist. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice. So just as Allah is just for you, be you know, persistently firm and standing for justice. Witnesses for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it's against yourselves or your parents or your relatives or if someone's rich or someone's poor, Allah is more worthy of both. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't follow your personal inclinations uh, so that you know, otherwise you would find that you are not being just. Um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns people that, uh, that, that, that are not just when that, whenever they do judge between people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally, He warns the hypocrites and the disbelievers. 
And here, lastly, this is beautiful. The last verse of this juz, the last ayah of this juz, verse 147. مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَآمَنْتُمْ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ شَاكِرًا عَلِيمًا That what would Allah do with your punishment? Why would Allah want to punish you if you're grateful and you believe? Remember, the juz started off with, وَاللَّهُ يُرِيدُ أَنْ يَتُوبَ عَلِيكُمْ Allah wants to forgive you. And it ends with, why would Allah want to punish you? What does Allah have to gain from punishing you in shakartum wa amantum? If you are grateful and if you believe, wa kan Allahu shakiran alima, and Allah is appreciative and Allah is all knowing. If you notice here in the end, Allah did not mention that He is all knowing and all forgiving, or all knowing and all merciful. Rather, Allah said He's grateful, He's always appreciative, and Allah is also all knowing. Why is Allah all-knowing? Allah knows the law that He's given you, your capacity to handle it, how sincere you are in trying to fulfill that covenant, your weaknesses because Allah created you. Allah knows if a person really wants to be forgiven. Allah knows where a person's priorities lie. Allah knows these things. So, كان الله شاكراً عليماً Allah is grateful, He's appreciative, as well as all-knowing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us once again that he has no benefit from punishing anybody, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the path easy for you to salvation. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those who forever incline towards the truth and who live and die upon it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon our brother uh, Muhammad Ali um, and, and make it easy for his family and to join us with him and with, with, with the righteous and the highest level of Jannah al firdaus with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma ameen. Zakum Allah khairan to you all. I'll see you tomorrow, inshaAllah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.